Hi, everyone. Yeah, I was praying about a song this morning, and it um, feels like there's been a lot of wash in the mind this weekend. So I'm going to sing a song called A New Beginning. <clears throat> storm blew through and erased the shadows. It's all wiped away. Clean slate stands before my eyes. A new beginning has arrived.
Hi, everyone. <laughs> Good to see you all again. <laughs> oh, what a treat. They're showing, they're flipping the screen, they're showing your lovely faces, and ah, wow, such an intimate um, experience we, we share to be able to join in this purpose so deeply, see each other's facial expressions, hear each other's you know, expressions and tones of voices, like we're all in one big digital room. And, uh, and because of the, the holy purpose, you know, I just feel such a deep sense of uh, connection and intimacy with all of you. And it's so beautiful. And Francis is joining us today. You've been watching and yeah. joining in too, yeah. digitally. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've been like you all, just watching everything, just, yeah, marveling on the perfection of the Spirit's plan. I really just feel, you know, it's just so profound when we step back and just truly trust that whatever that unfolds in front of our eyes is actually orchestrated by this loving guide and for no other purpose except to show us, you know, how to go back. And I just, um, yeah, I was thinking recently, like truly to, to live a guided life is to live a very, very, very clueless life, meaning that you're so willing to step back to just trust that everything unfolds is already orchestrated and to trust that we don't have to get involved in the decision making except to ask and allow the decisions to be given. So I think this weekend is just no exception. I watch on the screen and I marvel just as every day how perfect everything unfolds for healing for our healing of the one mind. So, oh, yeah. It's beautiful. And then, what a great movie session with Kenneth and Andy yesterday, and, and then oh, hearing all your expressions afterwards, Anna Carroll and all of your expressions, it was so precious because you were just, the Spirit was just pouring through you at the insights you were seeing, and even the ones of you that were transparent, that, that uh, like Peter saying, it was difficult to watch, and it was easier this time. I've seen the movie before, but now I could feel there's anger underneath, and, and I was allowing it up more. So you could just see it was like a symphony of witnesses of, of, of everyone saying, wow, this is a, a new way to look at the world with insights coming through in the mind, and less and less reacting and responding and judging scenes like, oh, that's terrible, or oh my God, that's embarrassing, or oh, I can't believe that happened to this person. You know, those are the typical ego judgments and interpretations that occur as the, the deceived mind looks on this world. And again, Tim Reagan, who, who wrote in from Hawaii yesterday, he also wrote in again, again today just saying, he has only one prayer, and that's for forgiveness. And what that means for him, in very simple terms, is not making the error real. And he was sharing with us again also that, that the world is like a hologram, which is really just a projection, like a hologram in this world. It's just an image that looks three-dimensional, it looks real, uh, but it, it is not. It's just a, a projection. And that the body and the world you know, we're made by the ego to make the error real. So if you've got this little p tiny mad idea in your mind, the Holy Spirit has one purpose, which is to show you that the tiny mad idea, the error, is not real. In fact, that it never even happened. <laughs> and then you have the ego that projects out this giant cosmos of sights and sounds and images, just a hologram, for one purpose is to try to fool your mind into believing that the error is real, that the separation happened. Even Eric, he just showed that little clip at the very end uh, in, after the morning session from Into the Kingdom where I was mm -hmm. talking about hypotheticals and some of you might say well, hypotheticals and how is this cosmos hypothetical? Uh, hypothetical just means is as if. So uh, you could say hypothetically speaking next week 
you know, as if uh, I will be there next week doing something, this and that, that's a hypothetical. Actually, the whole cosmos is a hypothetical, as if the separation actually occurred. Mm. That's what the error is. The error is the, the belief that you can actually separate from God and that the separation is real. So then the ego, it's just a crazy, tiny, mad idea in the mind, but the ego makes up a whole cosmos to try to convince the mind, oh, you did it. You did a terrible thing. You, sp you separated from God. Uh-oh, naughty, naughty, naughty. Now what are you going to do? Now you've got to survive as a body. Now you've got to plan. Now you've got to struggle. You've got all these relationship issues. You've got all these uh, issues with the environment and, and with the body and with disease. You see, it's all, as Tim is reminding us, it's all just a holographic projection for one purpose, to reinforce that the separation did happen. And the Holy Spirit, like in the movie yesterday uh, with Kenneth and Andy, you know, even though all these things are happening, you could see Andy was so happy. He was bubbling and bubbling with glee and joy. Did you see? And then, and, and you know, he was excited because the, the symbols were just showing the lesson of innocence, the lesson of authenticity, the lesson of, oh, I don't have to hold back. I can, I can really speak what's on my heart and I don't have to re just react and respond to the images. So that's good when we can boil it down and see that that's the, the simplicity of the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. And I think what also um, really stood out for me was yesterday when you said that we are not responsible for the problem, but we're responsible for accepting the correction. And I... I feel like this sentence, if we really take it to heart, that can save us so much stress and mind energy because then I, I really don't have to look at the ego or the, any kind of situational problem and then ask, why is this so? How did this happen? Why, where am I still not healed? But really, you know, just to, to actually ask, what is the solution now? What is the guidance now? And I think with even the movie yesterday, you know, anger seems to be coming um, and acknowledged or recognized by a lot of us. But there's certain, you know, maybe some of us don't feel, oh, I, I don't think I'm an angry person. But I think really the healing we're talking about is so vast. Jesus actually defines healing as to see that there is no separate interest or no separate self. So we're living in on earth as if we're all separate from each other this is the way that we have been living you know someone else needs healing i don't someone else has this issue i have other issues it's just all hypothetical but when we come together the spirit want us to to really go toward each other in the mind so much so that that the gap the feeling that we're separate or the differences that we perceive will merge. And I feel like this is truly the, the purpose of us coming together e either digitally or um, living a life together. It is really for no other reason but to come together in mind and seeing we're, we're sharing one mind. We're celebrating the healing of any aspect of this mind because we're no different than that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and it's, we have to say of all the wonderful pathways to God, and there are many, that uh, the pathway that we talk about a lot is the pathway that we have used is A Course in Miracles, and it's, a, it's definitely a pathway that incorporates the symbol of relationships. So it's, you know, ultimately pointing towards a pure, non-dual experience of light and love and oneness, but it's actually saying we can use those symbols of everything that we believe in. All right, the ego made up the cosmos, it made up the body, it, it made up even these interpersonal relationships, it's all a construct. But the real question, like Tim was writing and saying, it's okay, if, if you have the purpose of forgiveness, then what you're really saying is, I'm just going to allow all these symbols to be used by the Holy Spirit to bring me back to that still point in my mind where I can feel the connection with myself, with all my brothers and sisters, with God, with Jesus, with the Holy Spirit. With, I can feel that spiritual connection. 
And, and it's so wonderful to think that every perception can be used just for that purpose. And sometimes when you, you look me or at me, you watch videos or listen to audios or Francis, you know, people see us and they see us just traveling, speaking, shining, sharing all around the world and everything. But, but I think it was Philippe who asked the question, you know, like he, he said, I suspect that it's not a, just a, an intellectual thing. Like I, it's not like an intellectual training. It's actually an experience that seems to require some kind of, of true opening, experiential opening in your in your heart in your mind that actually <gasps> takes your breath away that go you go oh my oh my god the wonderful fluttery joyful exhilarating expansive feeling that comes and and he was asking the how question like uh, how do you do this and also Helene our mm -hmm. friend from Switzerland wrote in too because she had a couple experiences too uh, one that was um, a couple years ago, and um, and then one that was ten years ago. She she wrote around ten years ago. Everything turned to into light around me, and two years ago, everything vanished around me. And those two experiences shocked me and left me with fear and the feeling of let's forget about this because I have no clue what that is. And and a lot of us have had kind of huge loving, maybe it's even just a loving experience with a, with a friend or with a partner or with a child or a parent. Or maybe it's we go to a satsang or we go to a, a self-realization gathering and all of a sudden, boom, we feel this bursting love and this expansive feeling. Uh, we have a friend, Andrea, who's over in Playa del Carmen and hers came through uh, psychedelics. So, she came through an, some, a few psychedelic experiences with ayahuasca that were so vast and so mind-blowing that she saw everything we've talked about, you know, the world's a projection, the people aren't real, there's really only love and light, and nothing, the world was, was nothing uh, because it was just so vast and expansive, and yet what followed those psychedelic experiences was a lot of struggle. Oh my God, how, how do I even survive? How do I even function in this world anymore after I've seen such a big peak into reality? And so she, she was writing long emails. She came to spend time with us here in Mexico and she just poured her heart out. She even told me she's had to use certain medications to stabilize like people do uh, oftentimes with psychiatry when they, they get a big peek at what's behind the veil and then they can't seem to function. Eckhart Tolle, you know, he had the park bench experience and then it took him what, a couple of years to, yeah. to start to integrate and it took him at least a couple years before he could even seem to function in the world anymore. It was so, uh, like Svava said, it's, it blew my mind. Is that the name of the lyrics? Something. Yeah, the, storm the storm blew my mind. <laughs> that was the song that she opened up with. Well, we'll say the holy instant can blow your mind. One, one mystical experience can be, to the ego, it is a mind-blowing experience. It is, the ego would even use terms like shattering, <laughs> where after that it seems to require like a, an integration. It's almost like if you've been looking at the world from an upside down perspective and suddenly you get a glimpse of everything when it's right side up, you feel a bit like Alice in Wonderland, like you've dropped down the rabbit hole and suddenly it's like, whoa. And so what Helene is asking and what a number of you have, have asked us, and we, we actually on a pretty much a weekly basis, we're coming in contact with people who have had such mind-expanding experiences that they're asking Philippe's question, like, now what? How, how do I go forward now? How do, I, how do I integrate my mind? How do I stabilize my mind? Even after that movie yesterday, you might have had some big glimpses throughout the movie and then you wake up the next day and it's like, deep breath, okay, now 
where do we go from here? And maybe Francis and I can just share from our experiences, because when I was in Into the Kingdom, I actually did a little piece there about talking turtles for Jesus, and everybody like seemed that. to like it over there, because I was talking about those little baby steps, and what you were talking about, the, the sense of, of waking up and really being clueless. Mm -hmm. I know we all enjoyed that movie, but a couple other movies that were considered for yesterday, one, uh, Andy, Pete, a few of them were talking about Waking Life, which if you get a chance to see that by Richard Linkletter, an amazing movie, Waking Life. And then there you were talking about Cluelessness this morning and being there with Peter Sellers and Shirley MacLaine, which is like more of a glimpse at that state of mind that is really clueless. It's so trusting and it's really clueless about the world. And it's not something most of us were raised with. You know, our parents never told us when we were children going up or they were telling us to study and do all of our homework and prepare and learn for college or university and adult life. They weren't really talking to us about cluelessness. They weren't saying, oh, you can trust your intuition and just enjoy life and just be carried down the stream to the ocean and merge back to the great oneness. You know, most of us were not raised with that and you certainly were raised like I was, very academic and very much, you know, learn and achieve and accomplish. And so both of us have had to dismantle quite a lot to come into this clueless state from all that academia. Yeah, it was a self-reliant um, way of living. And I think it doesn't really even matter the the skills, but we, we're all brought up as encouraging, being encouraged to rely on ourselves, make decisions, and also a benefit the self-interest because that's how we survive, that's how we're going to you know, thrive in life. But I think, yeah, on, on this spiritual journey, I just realized how, how much we really don't know what, where happiness is. We might try to find out where the self-interest is and try to make decisions, but they don't really yield to happiness. So I think, yeah, just feels like it's such a surrendering journey to let go of self, actually decision making, to give the decision making over to the spirit. And I, I when you talk about turtle, because I, I think at the beginning I came to the spiritual path with the same drive. Okay, I, I'm going as fast as, as I can. I'm going to do this really quick and give it to me, you know, healing. Okay, great. I love healing. I love emotion rising up. I love triggers. Let's just forgive it all. And, mm -hmm. and actually, a group of us who first arrived at the monastery, we felt the same way. When we mm -hmm. have stuff come up, we were like, yeah, I have something coming up today. Let's talk about it. And after a couple of years, I was like, Let's just, just tone it down, spirit. Just tone it down. <laughs> like, slow it way down. Give me some time to breathe. I, I, I cannot keep hitting, you know, being hit by this this darkness or these emotions, it just felt too much. And that went for a long, long time. To My prayer was be gentle with me, be very, very gentle with me. And that has been the, the, the prayer for the longest time. But I think at some point it, it changed back to this excitement um, because, because something started to click in the mind that I could really relax to just sit back and watch. And that was, why, why did that take such a long time? Because there was such a momentum to want to jump in to define who I am and what was my best interest. And the, the trust was not complete. But I guess when we, you know, just really use our everyday life as a way to give the decision over to the spirit and let spirit guide the decision, it, it is a pathway of letting the mind gradually relax to the point, like Peter Seller in the movie Being There, he was truly just watch the good elements of life, so-called good elements and the bad elements. There was there were no different for him anymore. He was in the end being suggested to be the president, and he 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 didn't really care or understand what that even meant. Mm -hmm. Just like, okay, it's it's all just. It's just all a dream, it's just all... But that, you know, I agree with 
with uh, Philip and everybody, this state of mind of being the dreamer of the dream has to be an experience um, because the ego is, is in there learning this course and wants to tell us, you, you just think like this. But we can't, we can't mix our thinking when the ego thoughts are like a pile of thoughts are still saturating our everyday thinking and then try to reach a state of mind. So it is such a journey of, of actually purification. So purify the ego thoughts um, through a very, very guided life. Yeah. Yeah. And we could give you a context too, because if you if you have used like a Course in Miracles, you know you go through all these chapters, and it's not till the very end of the book that Jesus has a section. I think it's called Self Concept versus Self, where he actually starts to give you a little peek uh, behind the veil, uh, which is very very helpful. It helped me. I, I was so immersed into the Course and I just dove into it so deeply and I, I would work with Jesus on show me what this means and I would read and I would open and I would pray and I would read and I, as I said, it was like eight, eight hours a day for like uh, two and a half years. And then, but that self-concept versus self-section, he gives us a little peek uh, what's going on. He says that uh, Salvation is really nothing more than escape from concepts. So he's very, he's sounding very much like the Buddha, you know, empty your mind of all concepts and recognize enlightenment. Jesus is saying the same thing as Buddha. He was saying empty your salvation's task is, is nothing more than the escape from concepts. And then he gives us a little peek about how that works, where he's basically saying in there that, you know, your mind believed in this hologram, you believed in this personality self, you really are quite convinced that you're a person. You know, it's not like you're slightly convinced. You are heavily convinced and, and heavily addicted to this persona. Even though the Greek, you know, when you talk about the Latin word for, for persona, it's mask. So now the mask is not just a mask, it's, it's an identity. There's so much investment educating that mask, uh, the, shaping that mask, uh, building the success of that mask, you know, everything that we were conditioned with was about, you know, they didn't tell us, they didn't say it was about making a better mask, but making a healthy, living, striving, surviving mask is really what it would be from the perspective of the mind, where the whole mask is just a hologram. It's, it's never, it's, there's not even a time where spirit enters into matter. There is no time, you know, people try to say reincarnation is if there's a soul that's in the body. But no, this is a hologram. And this hologram never had a soul in it. You can't put spirit inside matter. Matter is too dense. And spirit is so high. It's such a high vibration. You can never put such a high vibration into such a low, dense, slowly vibrating thing as, as the body or matter. So... It, you know, at one point you start to realize, you know, when you have these vast experiences that, that contradict everything that you've ever believed in, everything that you've ever perceived, everything that you've ever thought about. That's why it's so shocking, like uh, Helene, Helene was saying, if it's absolutely horrifying to the ego because the spiritual experience basically undoes the ego. It just shows you a glimpse of the complete nothingness of the ego. It wasn't created by God, it doesn't even have an existence. That mask, it, it may have been something you seem to put a lot of energy in, but it actually is, like Shakespeare said, much ado about nothing. Now, the, what we want to talk about is the Holy Spirit's function is exchanging concepts. So let's say you believe you're a man or a woman, or let's say you believe from, you're from a certain culture or country, you believe you have certain skills and abilities that you believe you've developed over this lifetime, or maybe even if you're a prodigy, maybe you have a sense that you developed them in other life, seeming lifetimes. But it's just been the ego's mask. Even with past life regressions, that's all ego. Everything, uh, even what seem to be past lives, is just the past mask being developed. That's why you have these sometimes ch children prodigies, they're like two, three, four years old, and all of a sudden they pick up an instrument and it's like, wait, where did Mozart come from? <laughs> How in the world did you develop skills 
like that at that age, and of course it's in the mind. The, it's, the hologram is just a projection. It's not even surprising when you see that the skills and abilities are all just learned. Ego learned abilities in the mind, whether it's it's playing a violin or or it's uh, some kind of ability to twist the body around, like people can, the children can sometimes twist into pretzels, and everybody ooh marvels. There's there's abilities in the mind that are just projected to form. So, if the Holy Spirit's task is exchanging the the concepts and the roles, for both, like Francis and I, we started off. In, with our our family roles, a daughter, a son, and then we had uh, educational roles, and then we had roles in terms of of the business world or seemingly surviving. You know, you're all familiar with these different holograms and memories uh, because they're very common. But ultimately, once we started to go for this awakening, spiritual awakening, then You've noticed probably if you followed what our how our characters have gone along in the dream that we've been used in very different ways than the characters were used early on. In fact, radically different ways. Ultimately, like we've talked about, it's not so much there really is no difference in form, so they aren't real differences, but it's just reflections and symbols of a different purpose in mind. When we give our mind over to communication, transparency, authenticity, when we give our mind over to trust and guidance, which has been following the intuitive, the internal guidance, then what flows from that is, is helpful. And really Jesus is saying that's the only helpfulness of the hologram is just letting those words and actions and symbols and behaviors be reflections of this guidance. Even when we meet other people and we do these collaborative projects or you know, we travel around the world where constantly you, you're meeting people, to put on a retreat or a gathering in any country in the world is a huge synergy. It's like a huge collaboration, but it's really the spirit that's doing the collaboration. It's not, it's not really ultimately a collaboration between the dream figures. It's a collaboration in mind of purpose in a quantum way where every the whole scene feels wonderful and joyful, but it's the mind has orchestrated this beautiful, synergistic, connected, uh, whole kind of experience. And like sometimes like uh, these uh, flash mobs, you know, where they show the whole flash mob and everybody laughs because the whole train station comes to life with music and then you see all the people singing and dancing and everyone goes, ooh, ooh, because they love the symbol of, of a train station. Uh, from this busy place of commerce and transportation turning into a yeah. flash mob. And there's something in the mind that likes that, yeah. that says, wow, that's, that's yeah. cool. Yeah, it's like the purpose is, is changed with just a mundane, everyday train station for transport. It, it you know, lights up the purpose. And I always think like um, in the Course, in Chapter 17, <clears throat> when Jesus talks about holy re relationship versus special relationship. I think, um, m you know, myself included, we all really want to know the difference in form. How, how do we do this? How, we, how do we avoid being the trap of falling into special relationship? How do we make sure our relationship go, goes to holy? But I think it is really about the purpose. And the purpose is in the mind, is invisible, but is held in mind. And he says, once you choose, both of you in a relationship, choose the purpose, then it's, it's done. Then the form will shift, and at the beginning it's going to look very, very tumultuous. It could look very chaotic, because he says the ego would fight, because the ego immediately recognizes the purpose does not serve its own goal anymore, and, um, and is not more gentle, to shift it slowly because the ego can adjust and adapt. So it, a quick shift um, is what we choose, and then the spirit would would basically take that purpose and orchestrate the form and, and make sure that going to serve his curriculum. And I see that as pretty much in everything. It's not just in the intimate relationship. I see that that is how 
how it is when we shift our purpose in life, when we come together. You know, like David was saying at the beginning, we live a life that is、uh, very much designed by our parents and ourselves, our peers, and society. And then we we design this life. This is how we live. And at some point in the mind, we you know there was a decision to shift that purpose, to wake up. And then you can see how the form started to unfold in a way that the mind. That that is calling for healing of it itself, actually has no idea. You know, the mind has to be so humble because it doesn't really know how to heal itself, nor does it know the means to to heal itself. So it cannot keep be keep asking about the form. So it has to let the form be taken by the spirit and just hold the goal. This is exactly what happens, and the form can look. So different and and even at times tumultuous, but if we know the purpose that we hold in mind is forgiveness and is going toward spirit, going toward love and healing, then we can just focus on that. And our everyday life、um, is is the same. You know, when a group of people living together in community,、um, David has been. A call to living community has his own community for decades, right?、Mm-hmm, yeah. And I've been living in the community for ten years, and we have like five people here in the room. We all live here for many, many years. But when we come together, like yesterday, I think Andy and Ken even said it. It's nothing but,、um, you know, all these seeming healings and darkness in the mind. But truly, we have to. Step back and in this humbleness to say this is because we have set the goal of healing, and this is why the the ego does not like it because it sense it does not going toward its own destiny anymore, and、um, that's why we use a lot of collaboration. So we put a retreat together, not really for anything else, but just to give this purpose, hold this purpose so firmly, and this. Jesus, I notice, always、um, coordinate forms to bring people together in these ways. At first, I was like, "Why is it always involving so many people when we collaborate with all these people?" But it it becomes making more and more. It makes sense to me because we live as if we are separate from each other, and the healing has to undo that. Has to undo that firm belief. So all of these collaborations. All of these div- daily livings become nothing but to achieve a goal of union in mind, and、uh, then we just celebrate whatever comes our way, really.、Mm-hmm. Yeah, and have very little involvement.、Um, you know, if you can come to the mind to see you, it has very little involvement in decision making of our own. Very little. The mind energy does not go there. It, it just really. Bring back to to prayer with the spirit to join with each other. That's the, that's the real work and that's the real goal. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. I think that it's like the guidance, and when you really give yourself over and you say, "Okay, spirit, I need help," and and I don't know how I got myself into this hologram.、Uh, as Tim was saying, you know, we seem to be imprisoned in a hologram, and and yet it's so.、Um, So all pervasive that it doesn't, you know, we were not raised that this was a hologram. I never, in all the the lunches and dinners I had with my family, never did the family talk about a holog, the world being a hologram. You know, in fact, if you had interviewed me when I was, you know, maybe seven or eight years old, and even let's not say hologram, not even use that word. Let's use a different word, like community. If you had asked seven-year-old David, you know, what do you think about、uh, community? I would say,、uh, what do you mean? You mean like my neighborhood? No. You mean like my school? No. My family? No. I don't know what you're talking about. And then if you'd interview me at 13 and you say, what do you think about community? I'd say, like、uh, Deer Park or the one. The again, I would have said neighborhood. I would have went through the same boxes because I had no box. For community, you know. Then, when I was in high school, I would study about communities, and what the, that's 
that's not the kind of community we're talking about. I had no box for it. Then when I was in university, I was going to urban planning, studying urban planning, and we would go into urban communities, but again, they were very geographical, and we could talk about this community versus that community, community activism. Community. It had nothing, there was no spiritual component to it at all. Even in my late 20s, when the Course comes into my life, I'm just, I'm reading a book, I'm feeling all this deep love and connection and, and starting to get a sense of like a feeling and a guidance and everything, still don't have a clue what community is. So, if you would talk to all of us, you know, Ken was a psychotherapist and we all had, Andy did some real estate and, you know, we could tell all the different things we've done, but you know, we didn't grow up thinking, I just can't wait to be part of a spiritual community when I grow up. We didn't even know what that was. If somebody said spiritual community, we would go, like a deer in the headlights, you know, what's that? And then if somebody even tried to explain it to us, we would go, that's weird. <laughs> I mean, we really, because because it's, there, we have no reference point to it. So I'm saying this just because I'm saying, when you give yourself over to spirit, the spirit will have to use the symbols in the hologram in a new way, in ways that you've ever never seen them used. Because people ask us all those questions too, like, like how, what is the governing body like that, that in your community? And we're like, well, it's not really like a governing body. And they say, well, you have groups of people always have to have, you know, countries have to have governments. And and even in relationships, even if you talk about an inner relationship between a man and a woman, a husband and wife, they would say things like, who makes the rules? <laughs> who controls the purse? Who wears the pants? You know, who did, you know, it, and you try to do those same things, but our community is so unlike that. We even did a, a retreat at the monastery years ago, and um, there was a young man who showed up there from Florida, and he had long hair, and glowing blue eyes it was Cody, his first thing. And we were having a little meeting in the kitchen right after, there was a very vibrant retreat, and it was like he looked just like Jesus. Jesus. He was walking around, and it looked like Jesus was at our monastery walking around with this long hair and these glowing eyes. And we were having a little meeting in the kitchen, and he knocked on the door and he popped his head in, and he said, I just want to tell you, I had the most wonderful experience at this retreat. Like Jesus saying it to us with his long hair. And he said, like, I've never had before. And we all watched. And he said, and the, the feeling is, I came here and I love it here because there's nobody in charge here. And he said, thanks. And he closed the door. And we all were like, interesting reflection. When you come from Florida to a retreat out in rural Utah, and your feeling and experience is that there's nobody in charge here. Nobody in charge. Like it was a, it was a dance for him. He felt love and connection and, and wisdom and respect and har harmony. But he said he didn't feel like there was anybody in charge. And that's like, that's got to be the ultimate compliment for if, if you had somebody come up and witness that to you, then that would mean that you were like free of control. Because being in charge usually means somebody who's in charge means who's in control. And he didn't, he felt like nobody was in control. He was delighted actually coming from his life and his parents and everything to have an experience of so much joy, but there was no sense of control with it. So that's kind of like it is with the spiritual journey that when you're giving this, the hologram over to the spirit, you're saying, in the past I have used it egoically to try to build a mask and build a personality to try to be a surviving, strong, successful, independent, self-reliant human being. Instead of a weak, meek, codependent um, <laughs> uh, person, I, I try to be a strong, independent, self-reliant, you know, like, yeah, don't mess with me kind of human being. And Jesus is inside going, well, neither of them are you. You're, you're not a strong, self-reliant, independent person, and you're not a weak, codependent person either. You, the whole scale is, is not you at all. You're a spirit. 
You were created by God as a perfect spirit. And, and your mask, whether you think you're a failure of a mask or you're a success of a mask, both of them are unreal. All the positive attributes that we've projected onto the hologram and all the negative attributes are all attempts to make the error real, to forget the spirit and make up a mask, make up something else. And then, you know, even in this world, you talk to a lot of people that are very, very successful, very happy, and then when something changes, you know, when John Lennon was assassinated, how did Yoko feel? Grief. I've lost my husband, I've lost my life partner. Huge grief. When you have people that are very, very successful in terms of their profession or in terms of their achievements and accomplishments, but then they seem to be diagnosed with a disease or they, there's a scandal that comes that ruins their reputation or something that seems to happen. Remember, this is time and space. This is a world where we have plagues, hurricanes, tornadoes, we have scandals, we have things every day where it's almost like the ego is trying to go, ooh la la, isn't it great to be alive, to be a human being, and the, the body is so wonderful, and it's, got, it's so intricate, and it's so beautiful, and it's so wonderful. And then like Tammy shared, a 15-year-old commits suicide. You know, talk about poking a hole in your happy world. If you believe there's something great about this world, you also must believe the flip side, that there's just horrendous, sad, tragic things that can seem to happen. And the Holy Spirit is, is saying, listen, it's a screen, it's a hologram, and, and lesson number two is, I have given everything I see all the meaning it has for me. You're just projecting all kinds of ego meanings and making up, the ego has made up a hologram that you believe is real. And it's real topsy-turvy. You know, even you seem to go along for years, oh, things are improving, things are getting better. Oh, I finally got a good job. I'm, oh, I've got, got a great partner and a sweet kitty cat. And oh, it's going good. And I've got a, a portfolio now. I've got savings. And oh man, I got the world on a string, sitting on a rainbow. Got the string around the finger. What a world, what a life. I'm in love. <laughs> Thank you, Sinatra. Well, actually, Sinatra also sang my way. You know, there, yes, there are times I'm sure you knew that I bit off more than I could chew. <laughs> but through it all, when there was doubt, I ate it up and I spit it out. You know, and I did it my way. You know, it's like, okay, actually when Sinatra was old, he was on a stage, I think it was maybe in Las Vegas, and he was singing my way. I did it my way. And he collapsed and went face down onto the stage. And when I heard that, I was like, oh, my way doesn't work. What did Jesus say? Thy will be done, right? Why do you call me good? God is good. Jesus is the best example of guidance, of there is a higher self that, that has to guide me to be my true Christ self. It has to show me. Jesus came to this world like all of us. Not, not, Jesus didn't come enlightened. He came with some lessons to learn, some forgiveness to learn. And that's very humbling. When we look at the way shower had to face and release certain aspects of his belief in time and space to experience enlightenment, that's for all of us. That, that example was for all of us. Even if you go back to the story of Siddhartha and Buddha, you know, Siddhartha was, was in a palace and he was supposed to be the king and his father wanted him to be the, the king and everything, but what? Siddhartha was not happy. He was discontent. That's why he left the palace to try to go on the journey to find enlightenment, to find the Buddha nature was because he was discontent. So we have to take that as our role model that this hologram was set up by the ego and the only thing the spirit wants to do is help us see the nothingness of the hologram so that our mind can escape and remember its true identity. But as long as we keep trying to read meaning into the hologram, 
even in spiritual community, that, that's still the temptation. You know, the ego will still say, you know, it will try to build a spiritual career. As soon as you go on the spiritual journey, the ego is sitting back there. <laughs> okay, spirit, spirit. Now, now the mind's interested in spirit. <laughs> now I've got to throw some kind of new mask up uh, that, it, that will fool it into thinking that it's a spiritual person. Because the ego doesn't even mind if you conclude that you're a spiritual person because that's still not who you are. It's still got you, <laughs> even if you think you're a spiritual person. And a lot of times, of course, we want to just click our fingers, but actually it takes a lot of dedication, a lot of devotion. Look at the lives of St. Francis, of Mother Teresa. Look at the lives of, of Jesus and Siddhartha. Look at the lives of Ramana Maharshi. Even Ramana Maharshi, he was like 19 years old when he had this deep experience that he saw past the veil. He saw that death wasn't real. And then he devoted, what, decades after his glimpse, like Helene's talking about, the light experience, the whole world disappeared, those two experiences. You don't think Ramana Maharshi at 19 has got to face still the fear of disappearance. He's, he went into prayer, he went into meditation for decades, devoting his life to that, that inner calling. So we're going to talk about some symbols today because that's really what you're asking for. It's, you're, you're saying, practically speaking, even when I have some epiphanies and these great expanses and insights, you're asking me, what is going to be the st steps? Can you give me a glimpse of some of the the steps, or even the practices, or the, the devotions that I'm going to have to, to give myself over into to let the hologram be used by the Spirit to convince me that it's a hologram, that it's not really real. That's, that's what the, the spiritual journey is, it's being convinced. Mm -hmm. And the more clueless you are, I will say, if you're really clueless, you must have trust. Because the ego is saying, there is nothing beyond this world. The ego is saying you just have to survive as a body and that's it. And put your full effort and energy into just survival of the body. And, and what we've had to do is we've had to say that's actually reversed. That we would rather learn to be fully open and transparent and be fully able to communicate like we were in that movie yesterday, Adam Sandler, he had to go a long way from, from that closed down, nervous, anxious, protective little mask to, in the end, you know, you know his, his girlfriend saying, I'll marry you on one condition. You have to kiss me in front of all of these people. That's like in the Truman Show. Truman's afraid of the water because his father seemed to, to die in the water and he's afraid of the water. Adam Sandler is afraid of, of kissing in public. So that was one of his biggest fears, and yet the Spirit said, you have to leap over that fear if you're going to really go for it. We all have that mm. at some point. Yep. <laughs> I also, what's coming to mind too is um, Tony Berkman, Tony. Oh, Tony, this is so great. You know, you, you just poured your heart out, and you said you, you actually you know, didn't really want to do this on Zoom, so I will do this very intimately with you uh, without dragging you into too much of a public spectacle. But what I will say from your heartfelt sharing is basically what you're sharing is there's one area in your experience that seems to be like the buzzsaw. Talk about a buzzkill. You may seem to be making some headway, you build some confidence in certain areas, but it's in the area you're talking about, which is the course called Special Relationship, uh, that's kind of like the ego is like not so fast. Uh, you know, yes, you've been dedicated for years, for decades, on the spiritual journey, and just don't think you're you're going to escape uh, too quickly because this is like the buzzkill. 
In fact, Jesus, out of 31 chapters, he doesn't devote anything more to than this topic of, of special relationship. In fact, it's nine chapters. And when Jesus devotes nine chapters to something, you know he's talking about the jugular. This is like, this is the jugular. He wouldn't devote nine chapters from chapter 15 to 24 talking about one thing. Nine chapters about one topic. And basically he's saying in those nine chapters, you're getting really close to self-realization. You've come so close to heaven. And now you've only got one more hurdle and you're home free. But he spends nine chapters talking about this. Over the years, when I would go to visit Ken and Gloria Wabnick up in uh, the Catskill Mountains, a friend of mine up there worked in the kitchen, and they said whenever Ken would, would do workshops on this particular topic, she would have to buy like five times as much food for the workshop than for the, any other topic. Because people would just start stuffing their faces the more that they started to look at this. This is, this is the jugular. And so you really put it down here like this is what deflates. This is where, you know, it seems, even when you feel like you're making some progress and you're loosening from this world and the ego, the ego just snaps back with, oh yeah, this is, this is my ultimate weapon. It's, it, in fact, Jesus says the special love relationship is the ego's boasted gift. And he also calls it its, its biggest weapon. So when Jesus uses words like boasted gift for the ego and, and strongest, most potent weapon, it's because this is what's so deeply rooted in us and this is why there's a huge desire for the hologram to play out with some sense of intimacy regarding these interpersonal relationships and these bodies. All of our fairy tales, Cinderella, Cinderella and the Prince, if you look at, if you look at all the fairy tales, the fairy tales all contain some component of this, like, well, it's not all bad as long as, as long as I can say I have an intimate relationship that is successful, that will wipe out all of my horrendous failures. That's the belief. You know, it's that important. And, and yet, Jesus and the Spirit are wanting to use this for mirroring, to mirror and allow this unconscious darkness up. That's what the movie was about yesterday. Here's Adam Sandler, and he kept referring him to himself as, oh, I'm a secretary, you know, okay. All right, my job, all right, I'm a secretary. But that relationship he had with the Marissa Tomei thing was so important to him that his rage really didn't come out until he found out that his therapist was dating <laughs> his partner. That, that's when he dove on top of him. He, it was more than rage. <laughs> he came like a kamikaze attack. And that's when Buddy showed up in court in the next scene with the, the neck brace, you know, which he took off when he hopped into the car. And he's like, you're kidding me. Like, you know. But it, it didn't, he was so good at stuffing the, the irritation, the annoyance, the anger, and he actually, if you would watch this movie, you would say, no, that character, that Adam Sandler character is not the violent one. He's the one that got tased on the plane. He's the one that, that got, was like a, a rolled over. He was like a, a, a doorstop, you know. He was like, he was the most passive, fumbling, well, yeah, okay, you know, okay, meek, you know. And, and yet, he looked like a linebacker on a football team taking out <laughs> Buddy Rydell. When what? When it just was hinted that Buddy Rydell was dating his girlfriend. There came the, the violence, you know. He was just meek and shy until that. And that's what you're talking about in your, when you're sharing here. You're saying, this is what I need the most help with. And this is why, you know, when people say, even with spiritual community, they say, 
Well, when you're living in community, then you don't have any relationship issues. Oh, that jugular is still there. That jugular is there. That's the unconscious mind. And the symbol of if everybody is working together to let it up in a, in a context of presence, in a context of prayerfulness, or as Andy and Kenneth were saying, with the purpose of release. Clearly that purpose of release has to be out front. Because if you're sharing these, what seem to be bizarre thoughts and bizarre obsessions and bizarre desperate needs in a context of the world, everyone's like, yeah, yeah, okay, go. Save it for some other, stuff it and save it for another time. We're into productivity. We're into bigger, better, faster, more. We're into whatever, make the world a better place. You know, it's always some form goal that's important. And then those devastating emotions, let's call them what, how they feel, they're devastating. So I'm just so glad that you really took the time and took this opportunity to bring these up. Because um, you said... You, it really came down to noticing that even in your interpersonal relationships, you really feel like you're not seen. You're really not seen and noticed and recognized. And there's a sadness with a hurt. Like, like uh, intimacy is so important. And sometimes I, I heard somebody rephrase intimacy as into me see. We so much want to be recognized. We don't get that from the world, so we want to feel it in an intimate partnership. We want to be seen, we want to feel heard, we want to feel recognized, and yet all those things ultimately still come from within ourself. There's still some kind of recognition that we're not feeling with ourself, that then we, it gets projected out onto the other. And then it turns into an enormous need, like, like there was somebody else who also wrote in and was saying, yeah, how come you're so loving with the Living Miracles community and you're loving and anything, but, but here I am, your wife, and you're not loving to me, but you're loving to all of them. You, you see how selective the ego can be. Like, oh, here's the, here's the ones I feel safe with. I can let a little bit of love out here. But then there's other areas where, you know, it's, there's, a, there's a tremendous fear. You say, I, I, I know I need to keep turning this over to the Holy Spirit and putting purpose out front. Though I want to share this with you in prayer so as to bring it up as I have a fear of sharing this on Zoom. Another thing that I reject myself and I make myself wrong about. So it's so beautiful that you, you took the time to just pour it all out because that is the prayer of your heart. It's just a very strong prayer for healing. And I think that again, even when we talk about things like recently co-living, mm -hmm. what are we calling it? Co-living with a purpose is what yeah. you wrote. That, yeah. that there's, there's a lot underneath that. That may just sound like a nice catchphrase, co-living with a purpose, like a cliche. But, but you, when you were looking at those ideas before we were really talking about it, you put a lot of time and a lot of prayer into what is the meaning underneath that? Maybe you can share a little bit about what you felt. Yeah, I think you know, Tony. What and all these um, questions or the yearning for a special relationship? I feel like deep down we're so much wanting intimacy, like the mind intimacy. That feels like really our natural state to feel safe, to feel joined and intimate with everybody. And I feel like you know the ego sometimes comes in to say that. I tell you exactly where to find it, and there's no other place you can find it. This is the, the designated spot to find what you're looking for, which is the mind intimacy. And then once you have that configuration, it's still a struggle, like you said. You still didn't feel seen. So, But really, the spirit is, is here to say that, of course, and that is our natural um, Desire, and that is what we entitled to the spirit saying, I'm going to bring you all kinds of experiences with intimacy without the, the box and the definition, and also within that too. Because the truth is that we don't choose 
that mind intimacy, even if we're we're in the the box as defined by the ego. So I think then it becomes like a journey of keep choosing, keep choosing that purpose. And uh, yeah, when we when we started to look at the the best use of our um, properties here in in Mexico, La Casa de Malagros, and also in Camps, Utah. Um, there was this feeling of opening it up to invite more people to to live, um, but in a way, I, I guess when I was looking at the the website, one thing I know is that people want to live together, even if you know the community word can mean different things to people. But really, deep down, we all want to to feel. The joining and the intimacy and the fun together—that is really we want to live such a way that there is no struggle and we're all just together. We're not doing it on our own. That is truly the desire. And I feel like just living with so many people for so long. I truly believe there's no reason we we cannot live like that. Um, and for La Casa, you know. Yeah, because originally I was looking at this co-living.com website, and to my surprise, how co-living has become a trend in this world. I mean, even now when China is wiped by this coronavirus, every business and school stopped. Everybody has to work from home online, so it becomes like, you know, by choice or not, everybody has to find a way. To communicate and and live from wherever they choose to be, you know. So I was, and then looking at co-living is the same experience. Actually, it's it becomes a trend where people they want to travel, they want to be be free, they want to go wherever they want to go, and they want to live with the people they want to live with for a period of time or for a long period of time to have some kind of deeper experience and or fun experience. Whatever they value, and I think even in Silicon Valley or San Francisco, those kind of areas where entrepreneurs come together, artists come together, coders, internet developers, they come together, they live together just because they they think it's it's way they can they can talk, they can have parties, they can join, they don't have to set up a whole house on of their own, so. But the thing is, for for us, we value. I know that there are so many of us that value the purpose of healing and, and value this intimacy and this deep desire to to fully live, you know, fully live. Actually, last night when in my dream I had this experience, where it was an experience that future is meaningless because. You can choose to live or not live now. You can choose to have everything or nothing now, and it was such a like clear experience. And I feel that's that's our goal. We don't really look at future happiness because because right now there is a a place of intimacy we can grasp. And I feel for for La Casa, the co living is. It's no shorter、um, purpose than that, but the form actually feels it's going to look very fluid and very flexible.、Um, you know, the the way that that came in was like because in our community, I said a little bit before, we use so many projects.、Um, our days are packed full. We communicate so much. We we work on a lot of projects and collaborations for this. Goal of joining in mind, and for La Casa,、uh, we feel like it's gonna be having this pra-、uh, flexibility for everybody to to choose their how their priorities and projects gonna be for that period of time. They're they're on site, and they can have the same kind of purpose, and they can have the same kind of joining, but it's not completely plugged into the. The routine that we have here, so yeah. Yeah. it builds the momentum. Like I think, Tony, I think of you, and and just just since I've known you, known of you, and just since I've met you, you know, already 
the what I feel the collaborations have started bubbling, and I can't tell you how joyful that is for me. I live for collaborations. I absolutely live for it. If people offered me anything in the world, and I had a choice of anything, any scenario or situation in the world, or collaboration, I would choose collaboration. I always do. I feel like every moment of every day for me is about joy. When I go out to eat lunch or dinner with somebody, uh, it's for joy. When I'm doing a phone call or a Skype chat or a Zoom call, it's for joy. When I'm doing anything in the day, any project or whatever, it's purely for joy. I mean, I, I lose track of time and space. I get so into the intimacy of the moment that I literally lose track of the time. It's not just like when I was a child, I would sometimes play during the summer so much I would lose track of, of time and space. Now it's all day. I, I, did, I, I oftentimes say, where did the day go? Where did those hours go? Or, oh my God, it's five o'clock in the afternoon and I think it's the morning or something because I'm so swept up away into the joyful collaborations. I, I receive like an energy too. I, you know, it, it doesn't, I don't think in terms of hours of days and doings because I don't really have an individual doer anymore. You know, it's like the, the doer was part of the hologram and, and my mind is not there in the hologram anymore. So it can seem that lots gets done through, so to speak, the hologram of David, but I'm oblivious to it. But to me, that's, I've equated the, the collaborations with the intimacy. So I'm, I, have, I have completely lost what seemed to be my former self into the collaborations. I see every meeting as a holy encounter. I see every time I, I meet anybody, whether I've never met them or I've known them for years, there's a vibrancy because I'm in the glee and the joy of our collaboration. And, and it's all a collaborative project for me. That's, you know, I, I don't even have projects beginning and ending. The, the lines have all blurred. It's just become one symphony of collaboration. And I feel like that's, that's how the specialness gets washed away because clearly Jesus even says we, the Holy Spirit has a special function for us. Why would he put the word special in front of function if forgiveness is our function? He's saying, well, the ego learned skills and abilities and the Spirit can use those skills and abilities and that's a glorious, it's a happy song when the Spirit is using that. But to me, there's nothing greater than that. I, I don't ever try to get away from something. I'm never thinking, I can't wait till this is over so I can get some intimacy. You know, <laughs> that would put it off into the future, away from my present moment, and then it wouldn't, it wouldn't be this, it, it couldn't happen for me. I've even seen how futile that is. And that's not the way the ego works. It divides everything up, you know, into my time and their time, whoever they is, or, you know, it's dividing everything up into the good times when you can do what you want and then the times when you have to do these other things. But I don't have to do anything anymore. My life is, is a free flow. So to now, now it's all gone into one joyful moment. It's just, it's just expanding and radiating from that moment. So I would say that even though this has been like a, a heavy um, topic, like when you look at, at the, the hologram and you say, oh, I look at the life of Tony and it's just been, there's been some sparkly moments and then some disasters and you're just praying for the sparkle to, to come into awareness and to grow strong and to be like not just a spark but a flame, a very strong flame that literally is what you can associate then with living. Because as long as we associate it with the timeline, it's just, you know, the ego is going to make it quite depressing. It's going to say, you've failed at this. It even uses comparison. Look at those happy people over there. Look at those happy people on TV. Oh, I see some happy ones on the internet. Only as a comparison to say, and then look at, look at me. You know, the me is always, it's a mini me. <laughs> but it's, it's not a real me at all, but, it, but it's a, it, it, 
it really doesn't work well when we start comparing one person to a next because that's just falling back into the trap. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just so appreciate you. I I know before I met you, but they were talking about you know the things you've done with your life, and and I was excited by that. Oh, it's in a, internet innovator. Ooh, 1997. Oh, wow. What was I doing in 1997? I. Yeah, my head was in the sand somewhere, while well, Tony was was out on the cutting edge and some doing some exciting things. You know, I, in 1997, I was I was wandering, lost, and and hoping hoping for something to to break through in my life. But that's why I enjoy the collaborations. Like I enjoy them all. Like this past week, I did four live streams uh, with Marina. And even though it was mostly Spanish-speaking people that were signed up and that were joining in on these live streams, I was confident. Am I bilingual? Yes, I am. Beside Marina, I am bilingual. Uh, can I f speak fluid Spanish? Yes, when I'm next to Marina, I can. I can reach people in all, many people that, that that David alone couldn't do, but when I'm with Marina, boom, I'm I'm a confident, fluid Spanish speaker because of the collaboration. Because I'm merged, we're in a mind meld, and I'm merged with that, and then I'm enjoying that. And then she's feeling it too, and I'm feeling it, and we're all feeling it in the studio, and we're all at the end, we're just hugging, and oh, wasn't that great? And we're high. We go get high because there's a spirit using it. And because I don't see the skills as the language skills as individual, hers and mine, I see us doing a like a symphony of extension together that's a very helpful thing. And then all the type chats and the messages come flooding in. Thank you. Gracias, gracias. Te amo mucho. Hugs and kisses. I can see lots of reflections, so I was like, wow. I really am fluid in Spanish. Look at that. I would never draw that many huge response of, of love and gratitude uh, if I wasn't uh, a fluid Spanish speaker. You know, I, I could never do that. So you see, you start to think of it as a mind, a mind intimacy, a collaborative intimacy. And that's, I'm always encouraging. That's why I have enjoyed the travel. I've enjoyed the community living. I've enjoyed the projects. I've enjoyed it all. I, I have no regrets. I even had a, a quantum machine one time years ago that actually was a printout and it says David has accomplished 100% of his life's purpose. And the lady who was reading the printout, she was like, her mouth just dropped open. She said, I've done this for hundreds of thousands of people, but no, it's never said, the quantum machine has never said, has accomplished 100% of life's purpose. To me, I said, well, that's, that's kind of how I live. Like, there is no tomorrow. Because it's, it's like Francis was saying, you, you can't really be in the full vibrancy if you, part of your mind is going to the future. You know, as if you believe there is a tomorrow. And, and when you go deeper into the spiritual experience, you realize there really isn't. There is no tomorrow. That's just a, a construct. It's all simultaneous, and, and there really is no tomorrow. So... To me, it feels very natural, and I enjoy it, but I'm a, I'm a collaborator. Give me the option for collaboration, and I'll take it. I'm like, yeah, 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 I'm in. Tony was part of the co-living side. Yes. <laughs> you, helped, you helped us build the co-living site. About the calendar, yeah. So here we are talking about the topic, and, and uh, you built it. So we thank you so much for that, you know, because... I don't have, I've dabbled in my internet skills for decades, but I have, yeah, now with you, I am an internet maestro. I am a whiz. It's like with Marina, I am, I am fluid in Spanish now. I am fluid in, in the internet because of you, Tony. So thank you. Thank you for doing that. <laughs> thank you. Oh, that's beautiful. Sweet. Well, we have, we have lots of those writing in, but I always love the interactive features mm -hmm. of that. And then we kind of have a, a nice little happy surprise for all of you at the end of today we're going to share, but maybe we should uh, open it up. Yeah.
Uh, you can raise your hands, your digital hands. I've been, we've been saturated in what you've written. Uh, Stephanie, Helene, Siji, I mean, we have many questions, but actually we just love these live interactions. So why don't we just have Eric uh, start uh, bringing forth some, some interactions here right in this moment. Okay, a lot of hands went up. I'm going to go with Lisbeth. Go ahead, Lisbeth. Oh. Hi. Hi, Can Lisbeth. you hear me? Yes. yes. Hi. Um, okay, I have been very confused um, since yesterday. Actually, since a few weeks, but since yesterday it got a bit worse with this anger. And... Um, um, I can really see very clearly that um, I went in my relationship with my ex. I, I played very little from the beginning. And so I'm, I'm coming more aware of, yeah, you know, I can't blame him that I played little. And, um, and underneath there has been all, all the time this anger while I was playing little, that he didn't see me, didn't acknowledge me. And um, yeah, and yesterday they were talking about the anger is, is okay as long as you don't justify it by, by your stories. But since, um, yeah, the stories somehow are in my mind all the time and I it seems like I can't stop them and um, because a lot of things came in again because my ex and I still own a little holiday house and I told him I want to sell or he can buy me out because I need the money to pay off my debts and, and I really feel sparkle about um, the co-living in Mexico or devotional and, and I really would like to have money for that and um, but now he is fighting me and that he brought in more money in the marriage so he thinks he owns the house and well it's it's an ugly ugly fight and I'm all the time thinking I don't want to go into the fight I want to have peace but at the same time I feel like I, I want to step out of my littleness and, and and tell him now and then, you know, I want to go to a mediator. He says, no, no, I don't want to go to a mediator. And, yeah, I'm actually really afraid of him. He can be so, yeah, violent with words and, and with hate. And I get all the time so shocked about that. And, yeah, and then there's all the time this voice that, that says, yeah, but you did this and you did that. And I'm trying to hand it over and but somehow I can feel how angry I still am after all those years and yeah I'm just so confused about okay I want peace and and then there's this thinking okay then okay he can have the house but at the same time I feel I do it out of fear I do it out of littleness so it's sort of level confusion um, what to do at the surface and what my purpose really is to forgive and and then what to do with the practical things you know it's it's yeah that's actually my question oh beautiful but well, it is helpful to remember again like was shared yesterday that when you feel that anger coming up, then and it feels almost like maybe paralyzing. Um, it's like you're you're feeling the ego's feelings. They're not your feelings, but they are the ego's feelings. Anger is the ego's feeling. The, e the ego is raging at God. The ego wants this whole cosmos, wants God to finally go. Okay, I've been dealing with you for a millennium. I'm just going to grant reality to your fantasy world, and I'll just bless it and say, okay, it's real now. And the ego keeps raging at God, just wanting 
God to, to pronounce this world as real, but God didn't create it, it's, it's temporary, it's not spirit at all, there's just no way uh, that, that it will ever have reality. So even though you're feeling the ego's feelings because of the identification with it, you know how important it is. You're going through like an ego detox. You're going through a purification. Uh, regardless of how your ex seems to be and how his words are or whatever, it's, it's like we all seem to have to walk through uh, something with a clear purpose. We have to have our torch out front. We're not, we're not you know, going to be kind of keep it hidden in our back pocket or keep it around behind us anymore. That's when we were playing little, we, didn't, we forgot the torch. <laughs> you know, we, were, we got so into the little role that we didn't really, and the torch was our strength. That's our light, that's our strength. So uh, we've all had to do this with relationships, uh, with sometimes with job situations, with, with relatives, with friends, with groups we've belonged to. Of course, you know the story with Francis. Uh, that's Judy Whitson's favorite story of Francis and the three priests, uh, where her ex sent three priests in to tell her she was gone on the wrong path. Uh, the first, the third one being a, a deprogrammer, <laughs> a Course in Miracles deprogrammer priest. But you see that by the time she got to the third priest, because she was holding that torch out and nurturing that flame of purpose, it was a bit shaky with the first priest, and then it was a bit shaky with the second priest. But by the time the third priest came in, she actually burst into laughter. And that, that showed how her purpose was so focused and strong that there was nothing that would stop her. And I feel that with you. you you've kind of been through a mystery school, you've hosted Kirsten, you've had a lot of symbols, you're building your strength. You know, that torch is, is no little flickering uh, matchstick anymore. Maybe it was in the past, but that's not who you are now. You've got your, your torch out in front, and you do have to remember that, that, that even the anger feelings can't stop you from, from your destiny. Uh, your destiny is to heal. Your destiny is to have happiness and joy and peace. That's important. And like with Francis going through, she was taking a lot of what the world would call big steps and, and facing things. But it's almost like that's like the Joseph Campbell, the hero's journey, where, where the hero has to face a lot of obstacles. Even in the Matrix, that's a journey to enlightenment. That's a journey for Neo to find out he is the one. But there's so much that comes at him that seems to be a temptation to be discouraging, depressing, insurmountable, you know. But this is a valiant journey that your mind is taking, a destined journey. It's, a, it's kind of destined by God for you to be happy. So I have every faith in you that you have the strength and you also have the... the can call upon the contacts and the nurturing and the willingness and the mighty companions that walk with you. Uh, this is not a lonely journey. You're not on this journey all alone. You, you now are starting to call forth more and more witnesses of support. And this is, what you're describing is quite common. Regardless of how, what happened in the past or how the personalities are or whatever, it's like this, inside you're saying, this is important and, and I want a resolution because I have to go forward. This is, this is just one step. You're not feeling like this is the end all be all right here. This is like one step, but yet one very important step that's very important. And that's where your conviction and your persistence can come in. We all, we all seem to grow stronger when we have to walk through these things and then our, our, our character, our strength in our mind, just, we, it just grows stronger and stronger. And it's, it's all just loosening from this belief in this hologram, you know. In the end, that's the happy realization is at the end was, was the love was always with me and the love was me. The love is me. You know, it, that's always the, the self-realization is the happy recognition of, of that love. 
And you've had enough of those experiences now that you, you can do this. I have every faith in you to, to take these steps and to be persistent and say, actually, it's important. I'm not going to forget about this. I'm not going to just stuff it under the rug or, or pretend it's not there. You know, if there's this elephant in the room, I'm going to talk about the elephant authentically, and, uh, and I can do this. I can do this. Yeah, and I think it's also like a very deep, you know, the surface situations is always reflect of this, this deep, deep mind pattern. And, uh, you know, if, if you have this story around how much you have been playing weak, then I feel like even there is like this self-hatred or judgment around yourself. Really, that was the frustration of how to, how can I speak up? Can I really speak up about what is truly important? I feel that is, if, you, if you're talking about practical, instead of really holding a story about someone else, you know, you can just start it to, to say what is important to me and really let your mind to go there and be able to speak up from that place because it's like a self-hatred underneath that, yeah. Beautiful. Thank you, Lisbeth. Okay, thank you, Elizabeth. So, we have a lot of other hands. I see some new people, so I think I'll go with them. I see Christina. Go ahead, Christina. Hello. Hi. Hi. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Hi, everybody. I just wanted to thank you so much. And I was listening before I joined the retreat to the Dreamer of the Dream perspective that you had posted in September, I believe. Mm -hmm. And it just really spoke to me. And as I listened to it again last week, <laughs> I found this retreat just jumping forward in my mind. And um, when I really brought that into heart, like the simplicity of that, it, I started to see everything so differently, you know, just like watching myself from within and not, not coming from without trying to understand what was happening. And even about similar things what Elizabeth was speaking about, about being authentic and speaking with love for myself and for the other person when there was seeming rage coming at me. But even that wasn't even the other person. <laughs> like that's not who they are either. <laughs> but I'm not even seeing them. They're not seeing me. And that if I can stay with that, the reality of the dreamer, that it, it just makes everything else unfold so naturally and easily and so here's a witness <laughs> can i get a witness i'm a witness to that. thank oh. you so much <laughs> god bless you oh, thank you christina <laughs> thank you. Thank you. powerful that's very powerful that's so beautiful <laughs> thank you thank you thank you hmm simple <laughs> that's the best adjective to describe it simple gloriously simple Okay, next we have Debbie. Go ahead, Debbie. Um, yeah, I was just text texting you, Eric. Did, did, am I uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, I was just uh, texting to Eric that it, this is my second or third retreat, but up to now I was too afraid to raise my hand, so uh, <laughs> <laughs> now I did. Um, uh, yeah, it's just, um, I don't know what to say. Um, I just want to be hostage. I, I don't want to be hostage of this fear anymore. I, I, I don't want, I want to release it. I bring it up because I feel also uh, jealousy for all the people that seem so, um, um, uh, how do you call it, comfortable in sharing their hearts and uh, I don't want to feel that. I, I want to feel part of this 
uh, yeah, community of cell digital. Um, like in small groups, I'm okay. There's been a lot of healing, but in bigger groups, it's still so difficult to, to uh, yeah. Well, well, I did it. <laughs> you did it. I feel it. You did it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, I, and like what you were telling to uh, Lisbeth, um, uh, Francis, that uh, I can relate to that. I, I, I've always felt so much uh, self hatred and so so many uh, um, mirrors in the world that 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 uh, mirrored my my self hatred and playing small and not standing up for myself. So and now I was typing to Eric, please. If you can give me some time, so I was standing up for myself. Oh, <laughs> oh, that's adorable. Yeah, that's because, uh, I've been thinking about this all day and how am I going to do it? And yesterday I didn't manage. And into uh, when I was in the last into the kingdom retreat, the last day I felt I wanted to share, but I was too afraid. And then Jesus told me it was okay, my time would come. So now it's come and. Um, like I've been, uh, when I was 28, I was in a relationship that was very violent. Even at one point, uh, my partner back then tried to strangle me. And uh, there was a colleague who didn't want to work with me in the same room. And I had uh, a foster son since he was just uh, like little, like three years. And every day when I came into his room, the first thing he'd say was, I don't want you, go out. And it was what I was thinking about myself and I was disgusting my body and, and oh, I, I wanted to get rid of me and yeah, so this is a non going process of uh, letting go of that and, and not uh, buying into that. Uh, yeah, the ego is always trying to tell me that I'm not enough, but yeah, it has to be different. So, and also, David, I'd like to express to you that I was too afraid to talk to you as well. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I have to believe that also, because it's just an attack thought, I know, but knowing is something else than doing it, I, I experienced it. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. So... Oh, you have so many gifts to share. I, I think now that you've kind of made it over that hump, and yeah. you've talked to me, you've shared with everybody, and you overcame that fear, then now it's just going to be downhill. I mean, the, you have so much light and gifts to share that it's just going to start gushing through you and it's going to start to feel more and more natural. And you'll forget about that old uh, holographic image there from the past and, and those, some of those crazy experiences, they'll just get rinsed, rinsed free of your mind. Uh, it's just beautiful. I just thank you for your courage to, to do this. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you. Okay, beautiful. Next we have Linda Hall. Go ahead, Linda. Good morning. Good morning. Hi, David and Francis. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Oh, okay, fantastic. There you are. Uh, this retreat has been fantastic. I so look forward to collaborating with you when you come to St. Augustine in May. Fantastic. So today we're all trying to learn this concept of the dreamer of the dream and really get it into our minds. We all want the peace of God. So for me, what I would really like, I see us all on the bridge to the real world. One side is the ego and everything we don't want. The other side is Jesus with his open arms. Based on your experience, would you please coach us with a trust walk to Jesus? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's interesting. A lot of the music that I listen to, a really faith-based music, um, is, is really a call. Uh, it's almost like when you close your eyes and you're on a trust walk, uh, which I've done that exercise with people around the world where... I will pair them up and I will just say, now take your partner's hand and close your eyes, or sometimes we even put a blindfold on, and, and have people just go into that experience of, of taking that sight, the physical sight out of there, and really holding on to that hand with great trust. 
And for many people, they just have tears because they're like, oh my God, I've, I, I never ever allowed myself uh, to, like, to be blindfolded like that and to so fully trust even one other person. Uh, sometimes people will do it with like a, a fall back, like falling back uh, the, in, in, into loving arms or being held or whatever. And I feel like that's what Jesus is saying is like, he's like, I'm giving you the instructions very gently and very carefully to, to loosen the, the heaviness and the fear in the mind. And, and I want you all to have baby steps of success, baby steps of listen, follow. Uh, kind of like that movie, What About Bob? with Richard Dreyfuss and, and Bill Murray. Baby steps, little by little. Don't, don't try to think in big terms of how you'll come into the real world. Just be steady with that practice, just for today, just for now. Just give it all that you've got and all the willingness and know that everyone is cheering you on. Everybody is cheering you on while you do that. So I feel like, thank you, Linda. I really look forward to meeting you. And it's like we walk together hand in hand, arm in arm. It's a very holy purpose that we share. And, and uh, I also look forward to collaborating with you. I've seen your name uh, uh, and heard your name a few times around the context. And uh, I'm looking forward to St. Augustine and Orlando, uh, to our experiences there in May. And, and just, I've gone to Florida many times, but, and I've been over to that area, but this will be another delightful, gleeful uh, collaboration for, for all of us. And I think we're going to also live stream it, so we'll just radiate that, that blessing to, to everybody. Thank you so much, Linda. Thank you for coming on. Thank you. Okay, beautiful. Next we have Calico. Hi, Calico. Welcome. <laughs> Hi, honey. Um, well, great retreat. Um, I, yeah, just, I want to thank you for putting these retreats on because the healing I've had from this retreat actually was started with last month's retreat. And um, I submitted a question that was handled right at the very end of last month's retreat. And it was this, I've been, uh, there's been so much, this has been a very powerful month. And um, what was there was frustration with um, seeing these negative thoughts come in and not wanting them to land. But by the fact that I've even seen them coming in, they've already landed. So I, I you know, I'm like, fuck, what, you know, how, do I, how do I eventually get rid of all this? And I heard in, you know, it was very quick in that last Sunday, um, back to basics. And it was like, okay, you know, what I was doing was actually using my meditation practice to avoid dealing with these thoughts. So I, I'm living in a spiritual community and I have, I've had some issues with judging ACIM teachers before. And so we have a lot of ACIM teachers coming through here every morning. And what I would do is just go into a very deep meditation place. I call it the happy place. I'm just like, okay, whatever, you know, I'm fine with whatever. But Emily said it so beautifully when I asked this question of, you know, how can I just not let these thoughts land? And Emily said, no, that's, you know, any amount of pushing away is where the healing is. And it's like, oh my God. <laughs> I mean, I kind of erupted on that last day and it's like, oh my God, it's back in my hands. I'm back to basics. I've got to take on all these negative thoughts and I have to stay conscious. I can't drop into the happy place even though I want to, because I'm now using my meditation to avoid listening to what anyone says. If I have even a thought, they have nothing to offer me. So I've been all month really going deep with this. And what I got was, it was beautiful. Um, my whole life has been one of hypervigilance on one level or another. And when I, when I, I was in hospice in 2012, and 
I was really scaring myself, okay? I had massive terror. And I came shooting out of hospice and landing into living miracles with this, we, I affectionately term it my rocket to God syndrome. <laughs> but what I have found lately is this rocket to God is actually interfering with my ability to rest in the peace of God. And so I had to really take on this hypervigilance of my mind training, basically, because then when I was in a position of being a teacher, I would have edges showing up of, no, you've got to be a rocket for God. <laughs> it's just, you know, settle down, Calico. Relax, Calico. And so out of this, okay, I can't push anything away, but I don't have to be like a, you know, I don't need to be going you know, 3,000 miles an hour and slam into it just to kind of see, oh, okay, now what? And so I really have this, I feel like a rocket ship, you know, that, that has dumped, I don't know what the last stage is, the third stage, you know, and now we're kind of floating to God. And I love that image of the turtles because I feel like, yeah, I'm a turtle for God. <laughs> 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 the end of the rocket. The end of the rocket the rocket. Um, the turtle, we're in the turtle stage now. Wait, oh, you know. now we're in the turtle stage. Now we're, <laughs> we're, we're resting. <laughs> Amen. Amen. But I just, I, I want to, for all the new people, because there's a lot of new people on here, and it's like um, the beauty of these monthly retreats for me. It's, they're not even retreats anymore. They're kind of like realignments of whatever's going on. And so once a month, I can come to Mighty Companions that I can hear clearly for whatever reason. There are many teachers I can't hear clearly. For whatever reason, you guys, I receive. And it's like, and so I just need to stay with this. And, you know, these keep doing the monthly retreats. It's like, it takes your Course in Miracles practice, and throws it into quantum. And it's like, and, and from there, all experience starts happening. And the joy, I mean, I've had more joy this month, but I had to go through some terror. I called it terror at the time. I had to go through some terror, but it, but it was like that. It disappeared like that. And so it's like, this is a skill I'm learning, and I need help you know, with the skill. And that's what I got from Living Miracles, but I was living there. I called it, you know, we were residential rehab for the mind, for God's sake. And it was like, and I needed that. I needed someone to just, I felt like I was being slapped around, but I, the only person slapping me was me. And that's what I got from it. And so it's kind of like living a life, not from being a victim, but being a co-creator with God. And that's what I got from Living Miracles. And now I'm living in a spiritual community that I call the halfway house of mind training because I'm still getting my lessons in whatever way I'm getting them. But it, it serves me to connect with your clarity once a month to kind of just make sure I'm on track um, because I can't trust myself. It never could. So I just thank you for, for doing these outreach programs for those of us that really want to hear in the most clearest way that we can hear and hear that for me and I I thank all of Living Miracles. I love seeing Andy and Kevin and Kenneth and it was just it's just kind of like yes we're doing this together and you know it doesn't matter if it's a fish finger or it's me blaming an ACIM teacher or wanting to kill my spouse. It's the same stuff. And so I just thank you. And I love being a turtle for God. And I can, I, I can just kind of relax during this next month, hopefully, in a, in a way that I have never been able to do before, because it, it feels like a whole new game plan is coming in. Oh, thank you, Calico. Thank you. We love you. You're, you're so much a part of us that even early on in this retreat, Kenneth was saying, ah, Calico was saying, go toward who you're angry with. And so you're is part of the fabric of the whole thing. You're always with us every month. Whether you're on the, the retreat or not, you're here. I, I was thinking of you this morning on, on the way over, and I think I said in the car, 
uh, to, to Slava and Francis, we were talking as we were just pulling out of the temple. I was talking about you and I was saying, yeah, how, how you, you're really focused, but you really, it's important to you. The ego will try to turn that into, sometimes to a, a hammer, or it will try to, to turn it into, like, like you say, a slapping kind of experience, but, but now you're onto it. You know, now you're gonna, it's softer and softer, and it's gonna be more gentle and more restful because you've turned that corner, and uh, you're not going back. So thank you. Thank you for being who you are. Hmm. Okay, thanks, Calico. Um, I see Raul and Marissa. I don't think we've ever heard from you, from either of you, so I've just unmuted you. Go ahead, Raul and Marissa. Hello, this is uh, Marisa. Hello. It's our first uh, retreat online, so we're happy to be here. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay, hello. And, um, well, first of all, thank you so much because... Uh, uh, well, yesterday uh, when we went to bed and after the whole day, I felt very, very peaceful. And that was really a gift and a process that uh, to be in this kind of retreat, which is for us the first time. And I had some resistance to to be in this form of retreat. Uh, I mean, virtual. And so, but I, I can see the value and I can see how it touches us, uh, me. And I felt really landing uh, in me yesterday in a very, really landing, like a touching earth uh, within, touching earth or God, like really finding that, that uh, mm. place to be. Uh, and really that peace that is not so obvious for me. I can really relate to the energy of Calico and the I am working this morning. I was away working because I work uh, with, you know, I hold um, groups and I hold process for groups and I was working and coming back home to my husband and I was all into um, uh, very restless energy after the peaceful night. And for me, there's always this thing of knowing, like I hear you, Dave, or I hear you and I feel like I know in that very instant, I know God in that moment. But then when I go into a timeline of experience in the three-dimensional uh, reality, like experience for me is um, somehow a way that, of course, uh, life gives me scenario for me to work, for uh, dissolving and bringing the fire and kind of letting the ego uh, burn and, you know, dissolve and finding spirit. But um, there is this engagement, this energy into experience that I feel I'm, I'm able to engage with, but also how much is that experiencing and being the experience and being this alchemy process of the fire of the experience, bring me away from the knowing of God. And that is always for me a balance and a calibration of that, of that moment of knowing in the instant and then how this knowing in the instant can be stretched in a timeline which I know doesn't exist in a way because there is no timeline if everything is synchronic but how how to keep that sensing of knowing God in the experience and in the burning of the experience in the fire of the energy of the experience so I don't know that's that's uh, I don't know if it's clear or anything but it's um, mm -hmm. um, for me a question in a way and um, yeah, that's um, that's a question that is there for me, which is a question which is always there and also um, moving and changing. And but it's somehow, you know, there is a, there is a tension that comes in the experience of uh, so, uh, of meeting a problem or what I see as uh, I judge as such, and knowing oh, there is a tension in knowing that there is a problem in whatever situation life brings me in contact and how to keep the tension of recognizing a problem um, low so that I can remember the purpose which has been told over and over in these two days, like remembering the purpose in, in the fire of the experience. Yeah, I would say that. I don't know. That's, that's uh, how it comes from my heart. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Libby. <laughs> yeah, I think just in your example of of even with your resistance to 
registering and showing up for this kind of a retreat, which is very different from most concepts of retreats. So it took a lot of willingness for you to, to register, to sign up. Then you had that peaceful experience uh, last night, which that's everything right there. You know, that, that was the whole point of everything. And then just your opening up and sharing that because you're, you're wanting to transfer that. You're wanting to carry that peace with you as like to be the light of the world, to radiate that light and love to every seeming situation and every person. And we're so joined in that, you know, this is, this is what we do this for, this is our entire purpose for this, whether we do in-person retreats or we live together or we do an online retreat. And um, I said earlier too that we would, we would close today with a, a surprise and, and our surprise is that we have had a, a man who has been very close with us and he has collaborated with us. We've gone to where he lives. He's come to where we live. He took a song that Svava wrote, received, and the name of the song? The Journey Home. The Journey Home. Uh, and he, he would make these beautiful paintings, and he would go to his groups, like you went to your group. He would go to his group, and he would get his guitar out, and he would sing these songs, uh, a lot that Svava had written and, and he was inspired by, and he just um, passed away. He just laid aside his body. His name is, at 42 years old, his name is Mike Michael Bromland. Mm. And he, he did just what you're talking about. He, he took it where he would go and extend it to the groups and extend it his paintings, his music, his joy, his lightness, his laughter. So we're so enjoying and have so enjoyed this intimate experience with all of you. And I think this is a perfect lead-in to uh, we're going to, to play his, his song, The Journey Home, as he's laid aside the body, as our, our, our goodbye song, even though this is just, it's a continuing story thing for us, but it's a, it's a memory of taking that peace that you were just talking about, Olivia, to extend that and have that become our very life and, and give it away so freely. And so, do we have it queued up so we all can, can hear it? Thank you again. Thank you so much for sharing. Oh, it's so precious.
bright light that shines and shows me the way to go. Your love has brought me back on track. I am whole. Bright light that shines and shows me the way to go. Your love has brought me back on track. I am whole. Wake me from the dream. I'm ready to give my life and trust in you. Wake me from the dream and guide me to live a life. appropriate song to, mm, journey, to home. journey home to end with. Mm. Thank you all so much. I just, I'm so grateful that we can share these intimate experiences and the hugs and the hearts and the kisses. <laughs> oh my gosh. Beautiful, beautiful. Mm. And we're so, I, I see some of you I've met and I've known for years, and some that, uh, Mike Clark, I saw you on there, you're coming down here to our little co-living co community there. Hi, Mike. <laughs> and all of you, some of you, I think maybe 17 of you are just joining us for the first time, but, but we really look forward to these at the first weekend of every month, and it feels very supportive and like, Calico was saying very, very helpful and very nurturing, and and uh, for some of you, I'm just like AC, uh, hearing you talk, Anna Carol, and just uh, knowing all that you've gone through, and hearing you talk about just the freedom and the happiness you were feeling with that beautiful smile on your face. You don't know how precious that is. Uh, thank you for hanging in there and and having the faith to, to hang with this and, and then sharing so freely your experiences, you know, during that movie, after that movie was so, so dear. Because that's what it's all about, you know, finally feeling the, the healing and the freedom as a real experience, you know, that's, that was the point. That is the point of, of it all. So thank you. We're with you. Ah, oh, oh, thank you. Well, we have a, actually a full slate of lots of things going on from, um, uh, we have a retreat down here coming in, a, in several days, I guess at the end of this week mm -hmm. we start. Friday. Yeah, we start a, a retreat at our La Casa de Milagros, uh, Spanish English. Uh, Again, it'll be fun for that collaboration. We'll we'll be there for that, and then um, we're actually feeling like we're going to do like an Easter Spanish English uh, digital celebration this year. Was that the tenth through the twelfth? Yeah, and then as we roll on, there'll be more and more and more. But but always, these global online retreats are just so dear to us, and 
We love hearing your expressions. Uh, Monica, thank you with the balloons. Uh, oh my gosh, you, we feel it. You, we feel the love and uh, all the balloons and how you just share from your heart. I think too, Monica, that was so beautiful because even though your husband was into it, the course in 2010, but from 2018, uh, you're, you're kind of like what Calico was talking about, like a rocket for God. And uh, I know you have so much joy and you're just on fire with it. And, and uh, yeah, look forward to, to seeing you, I think maybe in Mexico or uh, I think you're coming too. So a few of you are on there who have signed up to come and be part of the co-living. So that's exciting for me, you know, to, to look forward to uh, April and what's coming up. Yeah. Because we're going to be here and, yeah, we're just, that's part of our joy is just coming over to welcome and give hugs and rejoice together. And so, thank you. And thank you all for, for going through whatever you did to come here, uh, to resistances or hanging in there during the, the movie. And um, none of us knew that anger would be the, uh, theme. the theme. Ken's shaking his head, didn't see that one coming. He said that yesterday. <laughs> We never know. That's why we never know, you know, how it's going to go or what theme will be used or what movie will show, but um, it always is most spectacular. So thank you all for participating with us and, and joining. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.